Today's webinar is on the management of hypertension, focusing on the fixed dose combination. Hypertension is a major public health problem affecting 26% of the adult worldwide. By 2025, total number of hypertension is estimated to be 1.6 billion. One in five Indians are suffering from hypertension. Only one in two patients get a good control of hypertension. Hypertension has become the India's silent killer. Why? The 57% of the all stroke death in India is due to hypertension. Every one in two Indian patients have uncontrolled hypertension. As a rule of half is applied to India also. Very, very small reduction of the systolic BP will have a huge impact on the morbidity and the mortality of the patient. For example, a two millimeter decrease in the systolic BP by a non-pharmacological method by exercise or salt restriction or smoking cessation there is a 10% reduction in the risk of stroke. If you reduce the systolic BP by 5 mm there is a 14% reduction of the stroke incidence and 10%, almost 10% reduction in the cardiovascular mortality benefit is there. So, non-pharmacological method by which whatever the reduction of the BP up to 10 to 20 millimeter of reduction can be achieved either by the DASH diet or the salt restriction, regular exercise, weight reduction, that can be, that can produce about 20 millimeter uh, reduction of their systolic BP if you put together all the non-pharmacological method. So huge benefit will be obtaining to the patient. Similarly, the rise of systolic BP from 115 to 135, that means 20 millimeter systolic BP elevation and 10 millimeter diastolic BP elevation, elevation the cardiovascular mortality risk goes up by two times. From 135 to 155 systolic BP, it goes up to four times. From 155 to 175, it goes up to eight, eight times. That means the cardiovascular mortality risk doubles with each 20 to 10 millimeter BP increment. That means you, whatever the, by the method to reduce the BP, systolic as well as the diastole, that will be a huge benefit for the patient. Your goal, whatever be the guideline is there, the ultimate goal in all the guideline is reach the target BP 130 to 80. If you do that, there is a stock reduction incidence by 35 to 40 percent. The myocardial infarction by 20 to 25 percent and heart failure by 50 percent. So every two millimeter decrease in diastolic blood pressure reduce the severe risk by six percent. So try to attain the BP target at the earliest. That will have a huge benefit on the CV cardiovascular or CNS or the heart failure all these things will be there. This is the American Heart Association guideline is there. Here 
the BP has been uh, divided into stage 1 and stage 2 only. Stage 1 is 130 to 139 and uh, diastolic BP is 80 to 89 and stage 2 hypertension is the 140 systolic and 90 diastolic or higher. So all patient with a stage 2 hypertension should be managed with a pharmacological method. Stage 1 hypertension definitely this patient should be put on a non-pharmacological method. Whether you interfere with a pharmacological method that is based on the patient's atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. That risk score, if it is more than 10, the patient should be treated with a pharmacological method. Like the uh, associ uh, family history, there is an obesity, the BMA of the patient, uh, all this counts in the atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. I am not going to the detail of that thing. So ultimate target is all the guidelines, ACC, ESA, C, AHA, all guidelines says the BP is, uh, target BP is 130 systolic, 80 diastolic. You can see the beautiful city of uh, Singapore. The upper one, this is what is the city in the daytime and the night time, the city looks very beautiful. A lot of events are happening in the night time. You take any Las Vegas, anywhere in the country, so Bangkok, so many places in Dubai, everywhere. A lot of things are happening in the night time. The police is vigilant, the security system is vigilant in the night. So what is happening in the night that determine the beauty of the city? Similarly, what is happening in the night in our body regarding the blood pressure that determine the fate of the patient. So the, here you can see a diagram. In the x-axis there is a systolic BP and y-axis the 5 year risk of cardiovascular death in percentage. See somebody's BP is 120 systolic on an office BP recording you got a risk of 1. If that BP in the office reading again from 110 to 170 it goes it is around 1.2 1.3 risk is there. But the patient's BP if you record the BP by an ambulatory BP monitoring if it is from 170 the same BP if you are obtaining in the night time night time there the percentage of the death has gone from one to three percent so for that the ambulatory BP monitoring has to be done many patients you need to do it because somebody who comes with a white coat hypertension somebody with a masked hypertension if you want to know the variability of the BP all this thing you need to have an ambulatory BP recording because when you compare with an office BP, suppose it is 140 over 90, if you take it as a cutoff point for a treating a BP patient, if you do the home BP monitoring, it is 135 or 85. If you take the average BP of an ambulatory BP monitoring, it is 130 over 80. As it's average. If anything more than 130 over 80, if you are obtaining on the ambulatory BP monitoring, that is the average you are taking, that patient needs to be treated. Here the ambulatory BP recording a normal person. You see the BP, systolic blood pressure, in the nocturnal BP dipping, there is a normal dip as are there. Like, a, all, all, <clears throat> like a obstructive sleep apnea patient, many are non-dippers. Non-dippers has got a bad prognosis compared to the dippers. So normally you expect a dip of blood pressure during the night time but as the day goes up and in the early in the morning the morning BP surge is there. The morning BP surge is very determinant. 
if somebody is BP goes up in the early in the morning, the chance of cardiovascular, cerebrovascular accident all are happening early in the morning because the morning early morning surge is the uh, the problem. You can see the uh, what is happening in the daytime. There is sympathetic activity is there. When you go to the bed, your sympathetic system comes down. Sympathetic activity will be less, and your blood volume comes down. But in the early in the morning, there is a surge is there. So when you treat a patient, you should prevent the morning surge because the morning surge will produce a, an increase the cardiovascular as well as the cerebrovascular death is there. So you give a medication in such a way that that patient's blood pressure should be controlled till early in the morning. So that is why the importance of the long acting drug has come. And that is why the night time you see ACR by you are giving in the night because definitely it is going, it has got a longer duration of action, 24 hour action is there for a like a drug like a telmisartan that will take care of your the morning, morning surge and there is an incidence of uh, cardiovascular death can be reduced. Now it's time the COVID time. Many patients are on the mask. Here, what is we are mentioning in the regarding the BP masking is what you are seeing. It is not the real thing. In the daytime, somebody comes to your office. You are doing a BP. Your BP is well controlled. Patient, you say to the patient, patient is happy and you are happy. But as the night time goes, if you check the BP of that patient in the night time while the patient is sleeping, the BP goes up. That is the masked hypertension. Almost, almost 20% of the people suspected to have a masked hypertension now. Many meta-analysis shows that much is the incidence worldwide. So here again, there is the importance of uh, uh, ambulatory BP monitoring, master hypertension. Somebody who is branding as a hypertensive before that, whether you have done to the justice to the patient, whether the patient you have taken the patient's blood pressure at a properly, whether the patient has not a, um, in a sympathetic overactivity time, is running, walking and all, Patient should be comfortable sitting, relaxed for five minutes. Their foot should be touched on the ground. Patient's back should be rested. The BP apparatus should be at the same level of the heart. The 80% of their arm circumference should be covered. The and if you got a doubt, you can you have to repeat the blood pressure after five minutes. Maybe first time you are seeing the patient, uh, better to have a checking the BP on both arms also. Then there is a the patient who had seen you yesterday. Patient's BP was 120-80 and patient was sent back home. Next day patient comes to you with a right sided hemiplegia. Then you think I have examined the patient yesterday and this BP was normal so I sent the patient. As usual somebody with a stroke you send for the routine investigation like an ECG, echocardiography, urine routine and maybe the fundus examination. ECG showed an LVH, echo showed an LVH, urine routine showed the albuminuria. If you put it in the ophthalmoscope you can see the avian nipping or a flame shaped hemorrhage or something that is clue that the patient who had been suffering from something like a mass hypertension and which you have missed. So these are the patients uh, we should be very careful they may um, develop uh, somebody whose blood pressure in the daytime normal, the night time, the morning surge and the patient land in trouble may develop a stroke or a cardiovascular events.
you can also create an iatrogenic mast hypertension. That is, somebody's blood pressure who is on a very short acting antihypertensive. Some example, somebody is taking an ifidepin, 5 milligram OD, and their blood pressure is well controlled. The patient says, okay, my blood pressure is controlled, shall I continue with this medication? Many times people say, okay. What happens? That because of that morning they had taken the nifedipine, their blood pressure was controlled till 12 o'clock or till uh, maybe at four till four o'clock. After that, their blood pressure goes up. That is the next recording is 150 over 100 or more than that. So this type of variability is not good for the patient because. Even if you don't treat that patient, the patient's blood pressure would have been maybe a comfortably without much variation, 140, 90 or something like that. It would have been. This variability is there. You can create an iatrogenic mass hypertension. The patient can develop a cardiac failure, stroke and all other complications can develop an iatrogenic. Similarly, many situations, the doctors are done an iatrogenic disease to the patient. Somebody with an intracerebral hemorrhage, you have paralyzed the patient, hemorrhage goes up. Somebody with a very high, coming with a, into the casualty, with a high blood pressure, with a hemiplegia. See the 220 blood pressure, 190 blood pressure. Somebody sitting in the casualty, try to bring down the blood pressure as low as possible. What happens with that blood pressure only, there the brain perfusion was maintained. And when you do that, you are creating more harm, more area of the brain cell get involved, get destroyed by that thing. Similarly, somebody comes to you, the, uh, comes with a uh, uh, hyponatremia. You start on the patient on a diuretic again, the hyponatremia gets worsened. Or a, a patient with an acute kidney injury, you start on NSAID, the acute kidney injury worsens. The patient with the renal artery stenosis, you put a patient on IC inhibitor, that goes, the patient's uh, uh, renal status worsens. Somebody comes with a, a snake bite, it's, suppose it's a cobra, it's a neurotoxic uh, agent, it comes to you and uh, you sedate the patient. The patient may develop, uh, you don't know, the neurological complication, the tosses are, must have happened, uh, that will be missed. The patient with the perforation, you, uh, patient, you advise for uh, something like a, um, uh, enema for this patient. So, so many situations in the medicine is there, where doctors create, like a patient with a, you have done an angiogram to the patient, CA 60% block in the RCA, you put a stent down in the RCA and the patient develops strength, strength thrombosis, that is the end of the patient. So, iatrogenic mass hypertension is a big problem. Variability versus time in target. Somebody comes to you with a high blood pressure. The patient's blood pressure should be in a control in each visit. If somebody comes in the five visit, minimum four visit, their blood pressure should be controlled. Because if there is a variability in each visit and each visit variability, uh, that is also a bad uh, indicator. So, now you are going to manage the patient. What drug to select? Is there a fixed dose combination had been there in the past? In 1960, the reserpin was the one molecule which was available. That time itself, reserpin hydrochlorothiazide was has been the combination. Now in 2010-2020, people started using the combination like AC, ARB, AC bar, ARB, calcium channel blocker and diuretic. This is the combination has been continuing nowadays okay diuretics uh, again there's a slight change has happened uh, instead of the hydrochlorothiazide uh, people started using chlorothalidone or indapamide there is a tendency that somebody comes with a uh, stage 2 hypertension 
you start on one drug then the next visit patient comes to you you step up the uh, the same drug to the full dose then third visit you go for a another drug now you can see the mono if you do the monotherapy 75% of the hypertensive patient require a combination therapy only 25% of the patients will get controlled with a the monotherapy if you do a fixed dose combination combination therapy escalating the dose of the dual therapy or a dual combination therapy triple drug combination whatever you do there you will get a 75% of the people gets controlled there again the 25% is left that the resistant hypertension group is coming down over there so uh, all the trial the ascot the al heart trial heart trial all the trials you know there to achieve the target bp to achieve the target bp most of the trials they have used two or three drugs then only they got the control the al heart trial definitely uh, and heart trial and all uh, their clotrimethylidone was used and after that their blood pressure was very well controlled okay and this you can see the big, uh, diagram okay the chart you say if you step up from the example losartan 40 50 mg to losartan 100 mg you don't get an expected reduction of the bp but if you combine that even a small dose of a, another group of drug which acting through a different mechanism that gives a better result than uh, this combination so pattern of a bp if you see below the age of 30 it is more of a, a diastolic bp elevation when you comes down it comes to that it 60 years systolic diastolic as the age advances it is the systolic isolated systolic bp you can see the diagram isolated systolic bp diastolic bp has bp uh, is coming down and it is mostly the systolic bp why is this systolic bp you know it a younger age group that is the time their bp is determined by the neuro humoral factors the sympathetic overactivity is there okay neuro humoral factor is there if you look at their lumen it is like an uh, garden hose it is it is flexible but as the age advances like a, a plastic pipe it is not flexible there the peripheral resistance goes up by the age of maybe 60 70 and all there the peripheral resistance goes up so when you treat this patient at the age of isolated systolic hypertension at the age of 70 60 70 and all what you have to do is a something which attack on the peripheral resistance like a vasodilator drugs let's say calcium channel blockers or a diuretic will be a better choice at the age of 80 rather than at the age of younger age where their peripheral resistance is normal sympathetic overactivity is there you can go for the ac inhibitor or arb and sometimes you can go for a beta blocker also so you got a, a lot of options are there the uh, vasodilators are there uh, sympathetic uh, diuretics uh, renin angiotensin and all the blockers then your duty is to select what drug to be started what combination to be started so we are dealing with the hypertension the combination therapy in a special situations so anti hypertensive recommendation for a various presentation of the coronary artery disease patient so what to do the patient with the stable angina stable with the acute coronary syndrome patient with heart failure these patients are hypertensive so evidence says the first drug is uh, you can go for is a uh, enough data are available for using acarb 
diuretics and beta blockers beta blocker is very important when you are uh, dealing with a coronary heart failure stable angina or acute coronary syndrome calcium channel blockers comes down lower in the list aldosterone antagonists all in the lower down so you are left with the three drugs ac or arb diuretics or beta blocker and you can use any of these things in any of the combinations why use beta blocker you see this is the diagram showing a heart rate with the x axis and the mortality on the y axis as the heart rate goes up the mortality goes up so it is very very important to keep the blood pressure blood I mean heart rate under control for the management is there enough data is there for a beta blocker to use yes merit hf trial is there the metoprolol is used low pressure intervention trial is there so then that is about the metoprolol only but there are a beta blocker trial like uh, copernicus trial is there where uh, the carbidiol is the one drug which is used so it is very well used in uh, uh, in cardiac cardiac patients the cb trial the bisoprolol cb1 and cb2 where the bisoprolol is used merit hf of the metoprolol is there enough data efficacy safety and tolerability of the metoprolol was proven uh, here you can see that the copernicus trial there is a 39 35% yeah there is a 35% mortality benefit in a copernicus trial is there so here the carbidiol is the drug used the cb2 trial the bisoprolol is used around 35% mortality benefit was there merit hf trial the metoprolol long acting drug is used here here again that 34% Uh, mortality benefit so there is a proven benefit is there for the uh, beta blocker in the treatment of cardiac i um, mean cardiac patients okay like uh, uh, the patient with hypertension with a special indications these are called the special situation where the beta blocker is used there is a lot of controversy regarding the beta blocker because all the trial that time it was used the atenolol was the one used and where the the patients uh, increased death was due to the stroke was evident in many trial and there are people who are using the uh, beta blocker with the thiazide diuretic there is an increase incidence of diabetics has been proven but recent trials so this is widely used drug is a bisoprolol carbidiol metoprolol are widely used drug nowadays and enough data is there that drug reduces the mortality of the heart failure you can see that this is from the multi center trial based on that angiotensin ac inhibitors and beta blocker almost 38% Uh, reduction the patient's mortal reduction in a patient with a reduced ejection fraction so beta blocker scores over the rest of the molecule in the patient with a reduced ejection fraction no the initially the first drug came was a propranolol in 1964 this is a non selective beta blocker now it is not used as an anti hypertensive now this then came the cardio selective beta blocker then cardio selective with a lipophilicity you can see this the first generation beta blocker like a uh, timilol and all used in the ophthalmology this is glaucoma they are using propranolol is used for other purpose and all when the control of the heart rate you can use it but not used this as a an anti hypertensive nowadays people go for a beta 1 selectivity beta 1 selectivity means it is not 100% beta 1 selectivity they can have a beta blocking effect if this is dose dependent if the dose goes up they also can block the beta 2 and the patient can develop a respiratory symptom patient can worsen in the bronchial asthma and all and among the uh, the uh, 
beta 1 selective second generation the metoprolol uh, bisoprolol are very commonly used uh, nowadays as the selectivity beta blocker there's a third generation it's a non selective beta blocker that's a carbidilol and labetalol there the importance is uh, they got an additional alpha blocking action is there so they not only block the beta beta in the uh, sa node or rov node and the myocardium it also has got a blocking effect on the alpha activity that is why hypertensive emer emergency the uh, labetalol is uh, one of the favorable drug to reduce uh, like a gynecologist uh, there's for a stroke and all labetalol iv labetalol can bring down the bp very fast so it has got an additional alpha blocking action is there okay but nature is the one of the best uh, doctor they themselves do somebody's bp goes up there is a stretch receptor baroreceptors are there in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus what happens is the stretching up of the carotid sinus as well as the aortic arch is there they send an impulse to the vasomotor center in the medulla so that means they come to know the patient's bp is high so body what does is they send a para uh, the sympathetic impulse to the sa node is less and more of a parasympathetic so heart rate will come down myocardial contractility come down the oxygen demands comes down the opposite is happening when the patient is having hypotension they send a baroreceptor baro recognize the stretching is less they send a impulse to the vasomotor center from there the sympathetic over activity sa node av node purkinje system comes to action heart rate goes up myocardial contractility goes up stroke volume goes up and bp comes up that is why the body maintains your blood pressure if body cannot control you interfere so beta blocker got enough evidence are there so then a second drug which is used in a patient with hypertension with a cardiac or stable angina where the ace or arb you know the renin is secreted from the juxtaglomerular apparatus it goes to the suprarenal goes to the liver from liver the angiotensinogen is produced from the liver they convert to do angiotensin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 and the angiotensin converting enzymes are there in the lungs that converts to angiotensin 2 then uh, that causes the increases the bp running angiotensin systems gets activated okay then the aldosterone is released the sodium water retention happens then bp uh, increases okay so you can block any of this area and that can bring down your bp regarding the ace or regarding all the drugs the study has shown the maximum compliance to the patient is with the arb because somebody with a suppose a diuretic they may feel fatigue they may feel tiredness due to hyponatremia if calcium channel blocker is used they may get a peter demand or ac you can get a cough but uh, most of the time the study has shown the arb got the maximum compliance so now you got the half, plasma half life is very important take the, all the ace or arbs you take arbs the maximum studied molecule the long ha, longest half life is with the telmisartan real 24 hour action that is why the telmisartan molecules are used extensively in our days because the duration of action is 24 hours that will cover the morning elevation of the bp morning surge can be prevented okay telmisartan is the most studied among the arbs most studied you see the on target trial the largest arb trial 
almost one lakh population has been there. So take all the trial. So the it came out very very well. The molecular uh, effect on the cardiac uh, efficacy in a diabetic as well as the cardiac patient it is a very very friendly drug for a nephrologist also. I will come to that. Okay. You're talking about the. ARB, the telmisartan is a bidirectional ARB. Let's go to additional action through the PPAR gamma. You know, PPAR gamma is the, the pioglitazone is the one molecule which is uh, acting through the PPAR gamma. So, there is a lipid friendly drug. It is an insulin sensitizer. So, the diabetic friendly drug. So, that is the one action and the angiotensin 2 pathway then definitely they get blocked. So the tell me sartan or the sartans will reduce the BP, reduce the LVH, increase PIPA gamma, in decreases the insulin resistance, uh, decreases glucose, decreases so lipid friendly, glucose friendly okay uh, so it is a good drug for the diabetic patient that is why it has got a definite benefit effect on the proteinuria also. So that is why the diabetic patient with the diabetic nephropathy, irrespective of the BP, you are starting the patient on uh, in the telmisartan molecule. Okay. So third drug you have seen is the uh, chlorthalidone. Chlorthalidone is a drug which has shown a, it's a 24 hour action drug. India is the only country where 6.25 milligram of chlorothalidone is available. With the hot trial, uh, the chlorothalidone has come up, I uh, mean, uh, hydrochlorothiazid has gone maybe uh, almost in the, not in the out of market, but the fancy of the hydrochlorothiazid has come down after uh, hot trial and it has gone proven benefit in the stroke as well as the cardiovascular mortality. Uh, chlorothalidone is superior to all other uh, thiazide. So these are the three molecules uh, which was uh, uh, used in the case of a patient with a hypertension with the cardiac disease. Now comes to the calcium channel blocker. The calcium channel blocker, you know, there are three types of calcium channels are there, L, N and T channels are there. non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like uh, amlodipine, nifedipine and all, they act through the L channel. L channel means uh, they it's a calcium channel blocker that prevents the entry of the calcium into the cells into the cells so when calcium enters the cell the contraction coupling increases the and the myocardial contractility wherever it goes it is in the smooth muscle it is in the cardiac muscle wherever the calcium channel is there the calcium enters the cell the contraction coupling increases the contraction of the vessels or the um, smooth muscles happens okay so when you block it there's a good vasodilator effect is amlodipine has got an extensive study on these things um, 24 hour action is there amlodipine that uh, dilatation of the blood vessels is happening and the L channel is blocked by the non dihydropyridine and uh, blood pressure reduction is there when you talk about the silnidipine, this is a um, very good molecule. It is like a nephro-friendly molecule. It dilates the afferent and afferent arterioles are there in the glomerulae. It blocks the N channel. N channel means uh, the prevent the norepinephrine release from the postganglionic cells. When the norepinephrine is released, there's a heart rate goes up. 
so the property of a calcium channel blocker is most of the calcium channel blocker there is an increase in the heart rate but if you use a sildenafil it has got an l channel action thereby that reduces the bp the vasodilatory effect is there over that they block the release of the noradrenaline from the nerve endings post ganglionic nerve ending so heart rate friendly the bp doesn't go up i mean bp comes down again the heart rate will not be going up so peripheral vasodilatation is one of the property that also will be less with the sildenafil acetaldehyde is a one a new molecule is there they act through the l and t channel that also is a nephro friendly drug okay so what is the guideline recommendation the combination should be used to reduce the side effect and act, achieve the goal of bp you see if you combining a diuretic with a an acr arb because the diuretics produce the hypokalemia and uh, ac inhibitor produce the hyperkalemia that get neutralized okay the hypertension without the compelling indications there ac without compelling indication beta blocker is not used ac arb calcium channel blocker or diuretics stage 2 hypertension first stage can be a thiazide diuretic or arb okay so initiation therapy you can use ac or arb okay so the compelling indication based on various clinical trial when the patient with the heart failure diuretics beta blocker ac or arb aldosterone antagonist following mi beta blocker and ac inhibitor in diabetic patient ac inhibitor or arb and ckd patient ac or arb these are the compelling indication various clinical trials so this is the latest guideline says ac arb plus calcium channel blocker as an initial therapy in step 2 a single pill you add diuretic also you added so three drugs are there you still you are not getting controlled if somebody who is on a anti hypertensive you have used three anti hypertensive one of the drug is full dose one of the drug is diuretic still you are not getting controlled that means uh, it is a case of resistant hypertension you have to search for the uh, cause what is that resistant hypertension okay no what is the recommendation for a patient with a ischemic stroke whether you should bring down the blood pressure the patients with a ischemic stroke keep the blood pressure less than 220 or 120 don't aggressively treat this patient as i mentioned earlier because of that the collaterals are working the blood pressure is maintained for the cerebral blood flow if you planning to thrombolize the patient atp uh, thrombolize the patient you bring down the bp to 185 or 110 and during therapy 180 or 110 in intracerebral hemorrhage less than 140 is the systolic bp here again we use uh, uh, nimodepin is the one drug which is used in subarachnoid hemorrhage for reducing the this is the bp target uh, recommendation by the neurological neurological emergency so somebody with a resistant hypertension refers to a bp stays above the target in spite of the three drugs and one of the drug is a diuretics so here you have to look for the secondary cause of hypertension the second cause of hypertension means uh, these are the reversible most of the times the second cause if you identify the blood pressure control or you can reverse the hypertension in this patient if you properly treat that patient 
So cause of the secondary hypertension is this TAPS, Cushing's hyperaldosteronism, aortic coartation, pheochromocytoma, renal artery stenosis. But the mo one of the most common is uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, among the uh, endocrine cause, the commonly missed one is the commonest one is the hyperaldosteronism, like a cons. So, endocrine causes is the essential, uh, essential hypertension are 90 to 94%. Secondary hypertension is only 6 to 8%, of which the renal is the maximum. And primary hyperaldosteronism comes top in the list. Cushing and Feochroma, that means uh, we are not looking for a hyperaldosteronism but you look very carefully for whether BP is due to Cushing's or not. Okay. Renal causes are uh, the major cause of secondary uh, hypertension. You know, renal parenchymal cause like glomerulonephritis, uh, polycystic disease kidney and all, it is there. That can be identified very easily by looking at the urine and uh, renal st renal values and all you can tell. No, the renal artery stenosis is uh, one culprit. Many a times uh, the patient may come to the casualty or comes to the cardiology with a flash pulmonary edema and you treat that patient uh, the patient's good LV function is there. LV function is good then you search for the of uh, course, like when you do the Doppler, renal Doppler, you can identify that is due to a renal artery stenosis. You can examine for a renal brewery and all. Renal artery stenosis is there. Okay. So, two types are there. Renal artery stenosis, uh, if it is happening below the age of 30, mostly in the female, it is a uh, fibromuscular dysplasia is the cause. And older age people, after the age of 40, it is seen in atherosclerotic narrowing of the uh, renal arteries there and uh, easily you can stand this thing but if you do a carefully look at the um, ultrasound uh, Doppler will tell you the blood flow you can identify similarly the size of the kidney if it is chronically narrowed kidney means the size of the kidney will be very small in the case of a uh, renal artery stenosis and there is a disparity in the size between these two Another thing is uh, the, the patient with the renal artery stenosis, uh, their blood flow going to the glomeruli is less. When the glomerula, uh, the blood flow to the glomeruli is less means uh, the glomerula, just glomerular apparatus identify it, they release the uh, renin. So when the large amount of renin is released, similarly the aldosterone also uh, goes up. When the renin goes up, aldosterone goes up, renin aldosterone, aldosterone renin ratio will be normal or less. That is how one of the method of identifying the renal artery stenosis is uh, you can do the Doppler, you can identify it and uh, you look at the aldosterone renin ratio that will be normal in the case of a uh, renal artery stenosis because there is a blood flow is less a lot of renin is released from the juxta glomerular apparatus. You can see this is a fibromuscular dysplasia. When you use the standing a renal artery stenosis, you can do the standing also. This is a um, very commonly missed uh, hyperaldosteronism. Basically, it is an endocrinologist area. Okay. Uh, what is happening is here uh, the patient with the hypokalemia with the metabolic alkalosis and hypertension, you suspect hyperaldosteronism. But 50% of the case, hypokalemia may not be there. That's, an, that's another thing. Okay. What happens is, uh, here the blood flow to the kidney is normal. So, renin release doesn't happen. But autonomously, there is an adenoma or a carcinoma in the sonoglomerulus is there that keep on releasing the aldosterone. So 
just you check the aldosterone renin ratio aldosterone is very high and renin is normal it is more than 20 means uh, aldosterone renin ratio is more than 20 you are dealing with a case of corn syndrome or a hyperaldosterone so then the next the saline testing and all other testing you send the patient to the specialist okay aldosterone renin ratio more than 20 it is diagnostic of a hyperaldosteronosome. Hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis are the, with the hypertension, are the clue for the primary hyperaldosteronosome. That is the second commonest one is, a, uh, this is the Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome can be ACTH dependent or non ACTH dependent, ACTH independent. It's so mostly ACTH dependent. You know, Cushing syndrome, how you identify, you do the um, uh, a, um, at 11 pm, you give 1 milligram of Dexona to the patient, you collect the blood sample, the cortisol value in the morning. If it is elevated, you are dealing with a Cushing syndrome. Now, your duty is to identify from where the source is. Is it in the pituitary? Is it from the lung? Is it from the adrenal? If it is from the adrenal, if it is from the adrenal, okay, that means it is not as it is a malignancy or adenoma or carcinoma. It is independent of ACTH. So normal to normal level of ACTH or low ACTH with an elevated cortisol level that means you are dealing with a adis adrenal cushing syndrome you do a ct abdomen you can identify a mass over there the next thing is you do the high dose dexamethasone suppression test if you can suppress 50 percent you are dealing with a pituitary case of acth elevated 50 percent suppression is there that you are dealing with a case of pituitary adenoma. You do a MRI brain. If it's an ACTH, if something like an ectopic syndrome, there's a suppression is not there. The um, cortisol level is remains very much elevated. ACTH is high. You do a CT chest. Maybe many a times it's a uh, carcinoma, I mean lung, lung carcinoma will uh, may be the reason. So CT chest or CT abdomen. So you can identify the source of Cushing. Either it is pituitary, it is from the extra, uh, it's a malignant from the malignancy like a lung cancer or from an adrenal. Adrenals are independent of uh, ACT. And next is a pheochromosome, it is a malignancy or a lesions in the adrenal medulla. Adrenal medulla episodically, this is from the adrenal medulla, adrenaline, noradrenaline release in the circulation. So the patients will get a, an episodic, episodic palpitation, headache, tachycardia, all these things will be there for the, you can see a roll of 10 is there, okay. So. Uh, episodic release uh, patient comes with a headache, uh, palpitation, very high BP, uh, maybe diarrhea, all these things can happen in pheochromocytoma. Oh, just check the VMA or serum metanephrine or 24 hour urine metanephrine or urine VMA will tell you oh, this is a pheochromocytoma. But only thing is when you manage the patient of hypertension, Use both alpha and beta blocker together. Don't use beta blocker alone in this patient. This is an acromegaly. You can see the bone frame person. Uh, you can see year on year basis. Even the family member doesn't recognize the uh, the prognathism and the enlargement. You can see the heel pad thickness is very high on these patients. Uh, you're looking at the jaws, all the organs are megali is there, all the megali is there, all the wrestling people are, many of them are all this uh, growth hormone excess patient. How you identify is, it's very simple. 
the when there is a growth hormone is elevated you check for the insulin like growth factor that also goes up or other way you can do is any insulin hormone what you can do is uh, you go glucose challenge test uh, the growth hormones uh, level will come down okay this is a very important thing obstructive sleep apnea is a one of the major cause of the secondary cause of uh, hypertension is there 50% of the obstructive sleep patient, sleep apnea patient is having hypertension when you record the uh, bp normally there is a dipping happens but in the midnight time when the patient develops a 10 episode of apneic episode in an hour that is you call it as the sleep apnea in this patient in there is a, some apneic episode they get up the sympathetic heart rate goes up bp goes up sympathetic over activities there that will be continuing till the morning that is why these patients comes with a morning headache and fatigability that is a continue that's a you can see the uh, bp recording the sympathetic over activity that goes up they are, the non dippers are having a very bad prognosis you do the bip cpap and all these things but uh, cpap doesn't 100% doesn't brings down their bp of this patient okay next thing is a uh, coordination of aorta uh, children may complaints of uh, uh, pain on claudication on walking maybe when you look at the temperature upper and lower limb temperature may be slightly different the growth of the lower limb may be much less than the upper limb when you check the bp upper limb and lower limb mostly uh, after the um, uh, the coordination happen distal to the subclavian artery so both upper limb bp may be normal but upper limb and lower limb and the radio femur delay and all can identify only thing you need x-ray the rib notching also you can get it then there's a um, anastomotic vessels in the scapular vessels also you can identify okay you can do this these are the few examples of the secondary cause of hypertension if you correct the hypertension you can control the bp of this patient okay there are certain drugs are there which can produce the hypertension especially you know the patient with an oc pills they are taking an oc pills oc pills uh, you know it can induce the angiotensinogen and uh, uh, the bp can be elevated in this patient and as any drugs you know it will act on the uh, cox2 inhibition and the prostaglandin systems gets activated there are people uh, who comes to you in a ckd patient with a very high bp they may be on erythropoietin erythropoietin itself can produce a hypertension so a lot of drugs are there that can produce a hypertension so this a recent article has come very recently in the april 2021 Um, there was a lot of discussion on the ac inhibitor whether we can use it in covid a meta analysis shows that the patient who had a lower risk of death and a is with the ras inhibitor particularly in hypertensive patient just a recently it has come uh, but theoretically speaking ac inhibition will be good because the entry of the corona virus into the lungs through the ace channel and if you block theoretically that is a, uh, a good that should be a, a good drug for the use so this was the uh, so finally this is the recommendation um for the use the ish uh, 2020 uh, drug treatment strategy we have discussed about the various types of uh, uh, drugs we can use it and the evidence like uh, evidence on beta blocker the uh, as is and arb and diuretics we have discussed discussed about the combination therapy and something about the resistant hypertension and this was the recommendation by 2020 dual low dose combination dual full dose combination and triple combination 
and if there is a situation like a patient is on triple combination if you are not getting controlled you start the patient on a spironal active the moment you start the patient on spironal active if you get a very good control of the bp think of hyperaldosterone steronosum cause could be search for a secondary cause okay but you are left with a spironal lactam and centrally acting drugs like clonidine and all uh, there's alpha blockers are there but basically these are the three drugs which you use it regularly so world health organization added a fixed dose combination of antihypertensive medication to who essential medicine list and fixed dose uh, fixed dose combination pill is the solution and it is convenient better efficacy less side effect and low cost all the recommendations uh, you know japanese society all recommends the uh, management of iron hypertensive with a dual combination